Good morning. I, uh, by way of disclaimer, um, I'm not going to be talking about a lot about my own work today. I wanted to talk about something, and I want to thank both Kathy and Tom for giving me the opportunity to do this, which is somewhat daunting in front of this type of audience, where I'm not going to be going through my data, which of course is always logical and leads us to the obvious conclusions, but I'm going to deal with a several themes and provide some background so that we can have a discussion about the, you know, some of these issues. So the title, Human Cognition, Neuropsychiatric Disease and Genetic Variation, Life on a Continuum, essentially is, has, has, you know, kind of, uh, there are three themes that underlie this. One is that human disorders of cognition and behavior are part of a continuum of normal variation. Variation in brain structure and function is under strong genetic influence, and of course it's variation in brain structure and function that gives rise to these disorders of cognition and behavior. And then lastly, understanding individual variability and even studying individuals within the population will greatly inform understanding of human brain function and allow us to approach disease more rationally. So a kind of plea to think about individual differences, really, um, and also to think about these things that we call diseases as just part of normal human variation and part of the human condition. So um, this shouldn't come as a surprise to most people that uh, human psychiatric disorders are highly heritable. They're also quite common. Um, this is just showing the prevalence, and one can see some of these, like major depression, around 20% lifetime prevalence. Things like autism, schizophrenia, around 1%, Tourette syndrome, lower. But these are not rare disorders. And, you know, essentially my laboratory, and, and now, you know, a number of others, but my, my lab's work is interested in studying neurodevelopmental disorders from a genetic standpoint, taking advantage of the heritable and the non-heritable genetic factors that, are, that underlie these disorders to get a unbiased, mechanistic, neurobiological understanding of disease. But the thing, and, and, and this is just showing the twin and family-based heritability, which ranges from, you know, 50 to 80 percent for these disorders. So they're highly heritable, and they're highly prevalent. And so the major challenge for us is to use the, this heritability and genetic methods to now identify the causes of these disorders, and that's been really enormously successful um, over the last five years. For a while, it was looking a little cloudy and it was unclear, but once the samples got to a certain size and statistical power was sufficient, for most of these disorders, there really is some light at the end of the tunnel. For schizophrenia, there are now over 200 genome-wide significant loci that have been identified. For autism, a few dozen, although the architecture of those two disorders is somewhat different, and we can maybe talk about that during the break, uh, during the uh, question session. But another thing that we've learned as we get genetic information is not only are they highly heritable, but there's a high amount of genetic correlation. So these disorders that are called distinct bipolar and schizophrenia, if we take genetic risk for one and ask how does it predict genetic risk for another using common genetic variation, it's 0.6. For major depression and schizophrenia, 0.4, by, et cetera. Even autism and schizophrenia, which are disorders with markedly different developmental trajectories, um, seldom confused for each other, although, you know, um, 0.2, which is really remarkably high. So this is so again, this, pre this presents a challenge. What is the brain and cellular and molecular basis of this overlap, and what does it tell us about these disorders? Are they really distinct, and, or are they really separate disorders? So most of us, even the non-genetic neurobiologist, you know, I'll just read this, because my genetic programming prevents me from stopping to ask directions, that's why. When it's very, you know, we're all happy to invoke uh, genetics when it's very convenient for us, um, and, you know, and blame our behavior and, you know, on genetics. Of course, 
this is an example where it's unlikely that it's the genetics that's leading to this, um, uh, you know, perhaps annoying behavior. And I just want to make the point that I'm not talking about genetics as a determinism. I'm talking about genetics as a framework for understanding, as providing risk for disorder. But of course, it's genes and the environment that interact to make the brain. And the following very simplistic model where you have genes interacting with environment over development that lead to the cerebral structure. But it's not a static structure, it's a dynamic structure. So we go from molecules all the way to gross anatomy. It's that structure that's dynamically changing that um, really underlies behavior. But at the same time, cognitive function and behavior has an impact on that cerebral structure. So we're talking about a very complex series of events that unfold over development to lead to a behavioral syndrome or in strengths and weaknesses. So um, yeah, that's essentially the model. Genes aren't deterministic, but they're important because they give us a causal anchor. We know that the genes will be, it, the gene is causing the disease, not the disorder call, causing the, the genetic malformation in, that, uh, in most cases. So we can really use that as an anchor to begin to understand mechanism. So one of the first questions as a neuroscientist and neurologist um, that I would ask, you know, is that our approach to behavior is distinct from classical behavior genetics a little bit, but we have to learn from classic behavior genetics, which really started um, with, you know, one of the really classic uh, phenomena is the concept of G, or general intelligence. And G loads on to, let's say, IQ test is correlated with general IQ 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, depending. It's related to these psychoeducational tests. It's supposed to be a measure of general intelligence, um, kind of analogous to IQ. But what's interesting about it is that it doesn't predict many functions, including spatial, constructional abilities, in many cases, artistic or musical abilities, and or much of anything in an individual. And I'm gonna get into that a little bit and just show you a little bit of data, again, not my own. And most of what I'm gonna show you today is not my own data, but data that has made, you know, led me to think in a certain way. So now I'm gonna show you some actual data. This is a painting, um, and it's actually, to me, quite a striking painting, and it's, it's by an artist named uh, Jonathan uh, Lerman, who's an autistic, um, boy who's, who's quite disabled, and his mother uh, sent me his book, and they've sent me a, an actual uh, painting of his, which I really cherish. Um, he, uh, the forward to this book is written by the art critic of the New York Times. Jonathan was really considered to be um, quite a savant in terms of outsider art. So here's somebody who has substantial disability. Um, if you interacted with him in, in, in a moment, you would know that um, He's, he's not able to interact normally and has severe intellectual disability and language disability, and yet, and yet he, can, he can do this in a way that I never could. And so this is me. You laugh at this, and that makes me feel bad. Because <laughs> this is not exaggerating. This is about the apex of my artistic tart, um, uh, um, talent, and it really... Uh, I stopped drawing around, you know, I think I, I just plateaued around age five. Um, and whenever we had drawing classes, I was really at the bottom. I, and so it really just goes to show that ability is, is, is specific. There's certain things that I'm good at and other things that I'm not. And I think we have to really be thinking about it that way. We're not all good at everything. And, uh, you know, the same thing with disability. Disability is not uniform necessarily. And we have to try to understand um, this issue of neurodiversity and really try to, because um, I think it gives us really important clues into the genetics of human brain evolution, which I'll discuss, as well as into disorders. And of course, if we had a world in which drawing, um, as, as well as Jonathan, or three-dimensional construction was actually very, very important to be a professor, let's say, at UCLA, I had to be able to do that, I never would have made it. So it's just something interesting to think about. And um, it's not, this is one piece of data that I'm showing you. Of course, it's a little anecdotal, um, being tongue in cheek. But there, you know, there have been numerous studies over the years, and this is by Lawrence Binder, who's um, from the Weiss, which is a IQ test. 
And he basically shows that if you take people who, ha who have normal intelligence, who take an IQ test, and you look at those who score on one out of 11 subtests or 14 subtests, depending on which test they take, 71% score two standard deviations or below on at least one subtest. That's in the very abnormal range, impaired range. Almost 20% if their 14 subtests score three standard deviations below on one subtest. So again, this is data just showing that, now it could be, you could say people are having a bad day, but the point is that intellectual abilities and cognitive and behavioral abilities show a wide degree of indiv individual variability. You can be very, very good in some things and very impaired in others and even not know it. And of course, I'm sitting up here talking to you because these features also have a high degree of heritability. Just like other parts of our body, the brain underlies behavior. It's an organ like any other, and there's a high degree of heritability. And I show this um, twins just because they are so cute. Uh, they, it just always warms my heart. But uh, this is not their brains. They're much cuter than these brains, but if one looks at identical twin brains, they're really remarkably similar. And there have been tons of studies that actually show that monozygotic twin brain structure, the functional activation patterns, the cortical folding, surface area, and thickness are all highly heritable. I'm just gonna summarize this in these cartoons in the on this slide. The heritability, the additive heritability of major brain structure volumes such as cerebral hemispheres ranges from 0.6 to 0.9. Um, even the white matter tracts are highly heritable. And the heritability of cognition and behavior is still highly significant, albeit a little bit lower than the major brain structures. IQ estimates range from 0.5 to 0.7, language in the 0.5 range. General social relatedness heritability is about 0.6, and these relationships persist across the lifespan. One interesting thing about brain structure is that it looks like even the heritability of brain structure may increase over the lifespan, and this gets to aging, that the factors environmental and genetic that lead to aging um, be become more and more genetically determined, which is almost paradoxical as we are exposed to more and more environment. Well, now let's look at variability, you know, before we get in, you know, so these structures are heritable, but how, how, how variable are they? And so I'm just gonna show some recent data um, from Mueller et al. that was published in Neuron. It's a very strong paper, and they show functional activity networks in human brain, and they're here they use seven of them. These are networks of regions that are co-activated. So they, use, they look at blood flow and they're looking at activation, activity, co-activity in these regions. And towards the left is the frontal and attentional network um, and the global mean is shown with the dotted line. And one can see that there is a range. For, these are the motor and visual networks. These are the higher order association networks multimodal association areas that aren't just one sensory area or motor area, but are places where in information is integrated. And the map of variability is shown here with this heat map where the yellow are the most variable regions, such as dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, parts of the supermarginal gyrus and the temporal parietal occipital junction. All of these are involved um, in different hemispheres and higher cognitive function. And this regional variability is also associated with cognitive variability. There have been a lot of studies on this, but in this paper, they took core regions that were associated in 15 studies, so they did a meta-analysis. And if you look, the orange are the high variability regions shown again, both medial, lateral, left, and right. And here are the foci that are most related to strongly associated with the variety of aspects of cognitive function and behavior, and they also overlap these highly variable regions. So that the areas of regional variability, these higher modal associations, are also strongly associated with cognitive variability. And we're all aware of the seminal studies by uh, Koss, Merzenich, and others where they showed that even motor sensory areas are plastic and will change and reflect the kind of, um, the degree of, of, of activity 
or a sensation, the maps will change. Here, these kind of maps that are highly variable are involved in, in, in much higher integrative functions. And so the variability in these regions associated with cognitive and behavioral variability um, is really remarkable. 73% of the loci associated with cognitive and behavior variability in these 15 studies were in these multimodal association areas. So we, we know brain structure and function is highly heritable. We know that, it, um, that a lot of our, our variability lies in these tertiary association areas, as behavioral neurology calls them. So now I'm going to take a slight diversion and talk about what forms of genetic variation, especially what forms of heritable genetic variation underlie human cognitive and behavioral variation. I'm not going to get into the very thorny issue of the non-heritable variation, but we, I'm happy to discuss that. And there are people in this room um, who are working in this area um, who can make, you know, who I'm hoping will make some comments on that. So this is from Wikimedia Images, which is um, one of my favorite scientific sources. And it's basically showing here is years, and um, this is estimated population. You can see there's this huge spike across the entire world in population that started about 10,000 years ago. So most genetic variation in the humans, we all come from ancestors, and uh, through various bottlenecks, there are differences in populations. But most common genetic variation, that is variation that's shared with, let's say, 5% or more of the population, arose more than 10,000 years ago. And this common variation has been acted upon by natural selection to remove strong bad actors. And in fact, brain genes, relative to the rest of the genome, are under strong purifying selection. So it's not just you know, autism disease genes or schizophrenia genes, just brain genes in general. And a lot of the comparisons with disease genes have actually not taken that into account. So what this means, it, it, it kind of falls from this, that high frequency genetic variation, that is variation that's present in more than 5% of us, comes from a distant common ancestor. But the effect sizes of those on behavior and cognition are going to be small unless they're extremely adaptive. It's extremely you know, amazing positive selection. And so common variation usually has a very small effect size, each individual variant. And it may take thousands or hundreds compiled together to give you a high enough effect to have risk for disease. Large, rare, and very rare mutations are usually captured by mutation screens, such as sequencing. And their effect sizes are generally thought to be higher, and they're under strong purifying selection. That's why things like Down syndrome aren't passed from generation to generation, because they have a strong neg negative effect on fecundity. So we have de novo mutations, new mutations like Down syndrome, and other single base pair mutations that are that just arise in the germline and can cause uh, a number of neurodevelopmental disorders. But it's, it's unusual to have a common variant with large effect size. And APOE is an interesting, um, let's say, um, it doesn't quite obey that rule in that it's a common variant with um, a, a fairly large effect size. And by large effect size, I mean greater than 1.5 or 2. And I'll show you that on the next slide. As genome sequencing has occurred and, and as we get more data from human populations, we're finding that rare variation is actually more common than previously thought. And so each human genome c contains more than 10,000 rare single nucleotide variants, that is variants that may not be seen by anybody else in this room, but yet were inherited from your parents, as well as 30 to 50 new de novo such variants, approximately one of which will alter protein sequences. So this is a kind of slight rub in that we have these rare variants that are occurring that are being inherited in our genome, and uh, we, we don't quite understand the relationship to pathology because most of them would be either they're relatively new and have only occurred recently and will be selected for in the future, and that's probably the case with many of these, but we have to really 
in any model, we have to begin to think about what's the role of rare variation as well as common variation. But most of what I'm going to talk about is common because if you look at the effect sizes in genome-wide association studies for common human diseases, this was data uh, that Jonathan Flint and I downloaded. You know, you can basically see that the vast majority of loci have an odds ratio under 2. In fact, most are close to about 1.2. There are outliers here, and these are very interesting. And in fact, these really represent some of the early success in genome-wide association, which led psychiatric genetics and other people studying other complex traits to be overly optimistic. If I said that my odds ratio for schizophrenia or autism was going to be between three and four, I wouldn't have needed 30,000 samples to actually have a genome-wide significant hit. But that's the case. So that most effect sizes are small, and that is, again, consistent with the notion of um, ad adaptive evolution and positive selection. And I'm just going to show this in terms of an, a common trait that's been really well studied, and this is a recent paper from Nature in 2017 from a huge consortium that studies height. And what's shown here is the minor allele frequency, and this is the effect size of that minor allele which would be the causal allele. And one can see that most of the effects are very, very small for highly frequent variants. But there are a few rare variants with larger effects. In fact, in this paper, they found several dozen additional rare loci by using an exome chip. And the same thing could be done with whole genome or whole exome sequencing to find rare variants. These were very rare, but the effect sizes were large enough so that even though they only occurred in a few people, they could still be detected. So rare variants under 5% explain about 2% of the population-based uh, liability. But what's also seen is these same variants are also associated with lipid levels, type 1 diabetes risk, BMI. In other words, they're not specific, this notion of pleiotropy which again we're going to see in all of the cognitive and behavioral disorders. Overall, variants with less than 5% population frequency are predicted to explain somewhere between 5 and 10, 7 to 9% of common phenotypes such as height or top, type 1 diabetes. The issue is that this is not going to explain the population, but in the individuals that carry those, those particular individuals, which may be as many as 10% of the population, those variants are going to have substantial meaning. So now how about neuropsychiatric disorders? Well, this is a, a slightly thornier issue, but it's, it's very similar. But here's one of the problems, and as a neurologist, this has always struck me as something that makes psychiatry really tough to deal with, although I have to say, now after t you know, 20 years or so of being a neurologist, I'm now realizing that we're in the same boat. But these are psychiatric disorders or syndromes. Between, you know, let's, you know, 1980s and now 2013 with DSM-5, we haven't gone from 100 diseases to now almost 300. Human evolution doesn't work that fast. This is just a question of whether you're a lump or a splitter. It raises the issue that what we call psychiatric diseases are just levels of impairment when you get past a certain level, it's kind of an arbitrary threshold scientifically. It's a practical threshold that has clinical utility when, when people's adaptive functioning becomes affected in the world. But these really don't have much meaning or, you know, you could think, you know, how does this relate back to biology? And if I end up now having three or four disorders instead of the one I had before, what does that actually mean? But you can see that this moving target and the qualitative nature of these really makes these syndromic diagnoses. They're not etiologically defined. And in fact, it really fits with kind of behavior genetics that complex diseases are one end of the continuum of normal variability, this disease threshold model, where we set a threshold here where you check boxes and you have a certain amount of depressive symptoms or psychotic symptoms or social impairment for autism with repetitive behavior. And when you pass that threshold, you have the disease. Now, this is a very simple with a single locus model shown here where you have one gene from mom, one from dad, and this is showing that if you have the BB, you have a high risk. 
But imagine if we put thousands or hundreds of these on top of each other. That's essentially the model, that hundreds or thousands. Now, if you have a large effect size variant, that may be sufficient to push you all the way over here. But for most, it's the common variants that are additively causing this. And again, this is, this is shown here for autism, where autism diagnosis depends on quantitative impairment in multiple domains. This is an older slide from 2008, when language was still a, a, a formal part of the diagnosis. It no longer is. About 50% of kids with autism have substantial language impairment, but it really relies on social behavior and deficits in repetitive restrictive behavior. And what we kind of see here is that, you know, and this is the model, that there's a kind of continuum on each, th this is just a cartoon, on these major core features of the disorder, and that environmental factors, individual single nucleotide polymorphisms with small effect sizes, large structural variations, or large effect size mutations may push you over on these. So a large effect mutation may affect multiple of these domains. The underlying hypothesis would be that the small effect size variants are going to be related to language, social behavior, or restrictive behavior. In other words, they'll be the pieces that are related to more specific aspects of the normal continuum of that aspect of cognitive function or behavior. The idea is that if you have enough common variation that pushes you over here on social behavior and repetitive restrictive behavior, you end up on the autism spectrum. Similarly, if you have a large structural variant or a de novo mutation, it can do the same thing. What's the evidence that this is related to common variation? Here's an initial paper that's a twin study um, from 2011 from Elise Robinson when she was a PhD student in Angelica Ronald's lab evidence that autistic traits show the same etiology in the general population. It was more of a correlational study. More recently, Elise has gone to the Broad and has been working with Mark Daly. And really, in what's a beautiful study published last year, she shows that the genetic correlation between risk for autism and risk and just social behavior is measured by the scale of social communication index in a general population called ALSPAC in the UK is very high. So if we take the genetic risk for autism and get a composite score where we have the effect sizes and the variants, and then say, how does that load on to social communication in the general population? It's, it's close to 0.3 correlation in both of these two different autism cohorts. If then we ask, how about the autism schizophrenia correlation? That's also similar to what I showed you before, the 0.2. It's actually the loading of social communication in the general population is stronger with autism than autism with schizophrenia. Again, really getting to this point that our common variation in social function across humanity is what's um, highly related to common risk for autism. There's another side to this as well, though, which is the pleiotropy, so that autism also overlaps with many other disorders. Its specificity is it's affecting social cognition and mental flexibility. And I've just shown you this common variation cartoon. But one of the questions is, how do we get this lack of specificity here? What's been found through sequencing is that in addition to this common variation, there's non-heritable de novo variation that's contributing perhaps up to 25% of autism cases. But none of the major genes account for more than 1%, so it's a collection of rare disorders with extensive pleiotropy. And this fits into this notion that these genes aren't causing autism. They disrupt neurodevelopment. They disrupt the disruption of, they disrupt the formation of circuits that are necessary for proper social cognition and behavior. So how might that play out? One of the models is that of this developmental circuit disruption is that, in part, autism is a developmental disconnection of higher brain regions, these regions that are highly variable, that are involved in social cognition, language, and mental flexibility, these regions that are highly developed in primates. How does that play out? We don't really know yet, but it's interesting. Just recently, we had a finding that, you know, I just wanted to share with you. This is the only real data from our lab. This is old. This is from 2007. Brett Abrams, who was a postdoc in the lab, reasoned that genes that are expressed in these perisylvian, highly variable 
multimodal regions would be involved in disorders of language and development of higher cognitive function. This is just showing in situ hybridization in sagittal and coronal human fetal brain at mid-gestation. And I'm just going to call your attention to NR4A2 and CNT and AP2. CNT and AP2 is highly enriched in the frontal lobe. This is the dark signal, whereas the NR4A2 is more of a temporal lobe uh, gene shown here. Well, with CNT and AP2 is really interesting. Um, there's a, it, it happens to be caused the most common neurodevelopmental disorder seen in the Amish now. It's a recessive mutation that causes language delay and seizures and an autism spectrum disorder. And more recently, about a year ago, we found that NR4A2 causes a rare form of severe developmental delay in autism, including substantial language impairment. So this is a copy number variant that deletes that gene. So that was kind of remarkable. And there's also evidence that common variation in this CNT and AP2 gene might modulate language function. So one of the ideas here, just again for debate, is a common variation in some of these genes that are expressed in, in the brain regions that we are interested in. Um, and we're interested in, the, in them because when and where a gene is expressed in the brain tells you a lot about its function. If it's expressed in the frontal lobe, it's likely involved in that region's function. If it's expressed in the temporal lobe, et cetera, in that function. So the idea would be that common variation might be modulating general abilities in those regions, whereas the rare large effect size mutations um, will have a larger effect causing a severe developmental disorder, but not be as specific because it's disrupting development in a more profound way. What evidence is there for that? Well, this is really interesting. This is evidence from schizophrenia. So this, this uh, deletion has been previously associated with schizophrenia first, then epilepsy, then ID, developmental delay with schizophrenia, and language delay in multiple disease cohorts. And so in Iceland, Kari Stephenson and his DECODE colleagues did a population screen of all the known pathogenic copy number variants. I'm focusing on this one, but I refer you to the paper to look at some others. This is the 15Q deletion where when it, in, a, in a disease cohort, it causes severe disorder. But in the population, you can see these are a bunch of tests, frontal lobe function and other um, global functioning. This is a reading questionnaire, and this is a math questionnaire that is strongly validated to be related to, you know, to dyslexia and dyscalculia, that is, problems doing calculations. And one can see that the carriers have a very specific deficit. They're not globally dysfunctional, but they have a deficit in a very specific area. And it's, we wouldn't know this unless we had a population screen, because in the disease cohorts, we can never see that. And what's even more remarkable, let's bring this back to what we were talking about, genetic variation impacts brain development, brain structure, brain function, that actually the regions that are affected um, in terms of aerial shrinkage, the anterior cingulate, insula, and supermarginal gyrus are all in typical patients with first onset psychosis are also affected in these patients. And these are regions have been implicated in language function and dyscalculia in controls. So really remarkably, this rare copy number variant seems to affect, have a very specific general effect on cognition that in some people leads to a severe developmental disorder, possibly in concert with other mutations. We don't know that. But in general, carriers has a very specific effect on cognitive function that can be mapped to specific brain regions, these highly variable regions. So you may ask, how does this happen? How do people, I think I just dropped the pointer somewhere. Well, forget it. Um, so uh, how, do, you know, how does this happen? Well, it's really interesting. We think, you know, I told you in the beginning that these rare effect size mutations are going to have profound effects these rare large effect mutations have effects on fecundity. I think the effect size of many of these has been overestimated because of the ascertainment bias of studying them in disease cohorts. Let me see if I can find this here. Well, I can't point anymore, but it's, uh, let me see. Oh, thanks. 
Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Sorry about that. So I hope you can see the green. Um, but what's shown here, I mean, this is a huge population study. This is the number of carriers. These are all copy, structural chromosomal variations, deletions or duplications that have been shown to be causal in disease populations. This is the effect on fecundity, whether it's carried by a male or female. One point I want to make, having schizophrenia has a profound effect on fecundity. A huge effect on the male, less so in female. And this has been known for a while, but this is shown in their cohort. However, most of these are around one and non-significant. There are only about five of them that are significant, including this 15Q deletion is marginally significant. This is corrected, actually, so it is significant. But it's not a very large effect. It's, 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 quite, uh, it's quite small. So this is kind of remarkable. It tells us that our understanding of the effects of rare mutations is likely biased by ascertainment and study in disease cohorts, and that many of these may really be adding to the normal variation that we see in targeting specific cognitive functions rather than global disruption of the brain. So it provides a lot of interesting cohorts to begin to make brain behavior correlations. And this just isn't from this study. There's a recent study by Ben Neal and his colleagues that where they looked at educational attainment. So they have educational attainment, which is a, they're highly correlated with uh, IQ, and they see that rare genetic variation has an impact on educational attainment. This is the change in year of education for a standard deviation change in the normalized score. And one can see that runs of homozygosity, which would be potential recessive alleles, pathogenic copy number variants. Uh, but these disruptive, what are predicted to be disruptive and damaging ultra-rare variants have a fairly large effect, not as much as the composite polygenic score, however. So the, so the, the number of protein disrupting or damaging mutations in highly constrained brain genes is correlated with educational attainment. But common variation summarized by this polygenic risk score, this additive agglomeration of genome-wide risk from common variation has a larger contribution. But again, in those with the rare variants, the effect size is quite large, and it's going to be very meaningful for those individuals. I showed you before this slide that social function, so with rare variation, you can understand why that's there. It's there because it's either very, very new or it's de novo. But with common variation, why would you have common variation in the population that diminishes social capability? Why should common variation persist if it's deleterious or not adaptive in some manner? I mean, the obvious. So, so it must be adaptive. So this is, again, the flip side of disorders, why we have many of these disorders. We don't understand it for most conditions, but for things like autism, we're beginning to get a glimpse. So here, they've done a huge um, education GWAS and a genome-wide association study. And they take the risk for you know, um, the, uh, gene the genome-wide polymorphisms additive that provide, that predict to some degree educational attainment, positively associated with educational attainment, and then ask how is it related to other disorders, both brain and, and non-brain, as you can see there, ranging from you know, BMI all the way down to autism. One can see a strong positive correlation with autism in years of education. Really remarkable. So that's saying that the, again, that the common variation that is predisposing to autism and perhaps social dysfunction is also correlated with autism risk. Now, how about if one just took an IQ GWAS? So this is a huge, I think there are 200,000 uh, uh, subjects in this study. So they have a good precision in defining the kind of genome-wide genetic variant risk that is contributing to G or IQ. And you can look and see, again, very highly correlated with years of education, negatively correlated with ADHD and schizophrenia, again, positively correlated with autism. So two totally separate studies, but looking at very positive attributes, IQ and years of education, are showing that risk for this often devastating neuropsychiatric developmental disorder 
is also correlated with substantial strength in the population. So now I'm going to go on a very short, and then I'm going to end on a digression, because this really begs the question, what other abilities? It can't just be IQ. What other abilities are associated with autism and kind of why? So you've probably heard a lot of this, and you've seen this on TV and movies. Savantism, which is the presence of a particular focal area of expertise that is estimated that 50% of savants are on the autism spectrum. This is by Daniel Treffert, who has um, studied this extensively. And in fact, in this prospective study, um, well, it's, it's, Patricia Howland has been following autistic children into adulthood for decades. And in this study, they both looked at psychometric measures of expertise in an area and parental reports. And they find that, again, there's a high degree of mathematical calculation, visual, visuospatial block design expertise, and music expertise, almost 20%. Synesthesia is also increased in autism. How do we know this? We know this from the work of Simon Baron Cohn, um, one of my colleagues who I have to thank for this slide and some of this work. Synesthesia is when there's stimulation of one sensory modality and it automatically triggers a perception of another modality in the absence of a direct stimulation to that. It's present in four to five percent of the population. And it's really remarkable. Many synesthetes don't know it. Many synesthetes have other incredible functions. You've probably read The Mind of a Numinist by Luria, which describes an extraordinary synesthete. It's an amazing book who has a prodigious memory. So many people with these extraordinary memories are actually have these memories because of the fusing of senses. So it, it, it looks like there might be a heritable component. 36% of synesthetes have at least one other family member. And there's been some linkage work done, but no genes identified. And here I'm going to give you an anecdote, but this is classic behavioral neurology, back, back to the distant past, but which is the future, I think. Daniel Tammet sees numbers as shapes and colors. He wrote the book Born on a Blue Day. Has anybody read this book? It is an extraordinary book. He speaks seven languages. He invented his own. I think he learned Finnish, if I recall. You can correct me, in two weeks. Finnish is not the easiest language. He performs mathematical calculations at lightning speed. He's the European champion in Pi. He has Asperger's, pretty severe social disability. So this is an example of the, of the kind of strengths that come on the background of the severe disability. So if independent synesthesia and autism should occur in four in 10,000 people, because synesthesia is present in 4% and autism about 1%. So we see this in Daniel, but the question is, is this a, just an anecdotal representation? So Simon Baron Cohn did a study of 164 adults with autism and 97 controls. This is based on a questionnaire that's been validated, but it is a questionnaire, not measured. And the rate of synesthesia in adults with autism was almost three times greater than in controls. So there's more work that remains to be done on this to really understand this, but it is quite intriguing. There's also been association of absolute pitch with synesthesia. 20% of those with perfect pitch report synesthesia, most commonly with color. And when a linkage study was done, the um, loci were overlapping. Again, no genes identified. So again, just some tantalizing evidence that there are these really unusual areas of strength that come with uh, some you know, genetic risk for disability. And I guess it provides us, I think, with an extraordinary opportunity with all the tools we have to begin to dissect these and to understand extraordinary abilities and how they're related to disability as well. So I'm just going to end with this. What does it mean that a feature that is present rarely in the general population, is more frequent in those with a disorder. And of course, the human condition is one of strengths and weaknesses, but genetic strength can be the flip side of disability, in part because of the genetic contributions to human brain evolution. And in fact, 
the most variable brain regions, those ones that I showed you earlier, are those that have expanded the most on the human lineage. If we look at those, and you can actually see that evolutionary cortical surface expansion is strongly correlated with intersubject variability in these regions that we were talking about earlier. Cortical surface area is also highly heritable. So again, I'm talking about populations, but I'm also talking about individuals. And I'm talking about individual variability. And there are kind of two forms. One is this history and behavioral neurology of learning from the individual. This is Broca's first patient, Tan. Named Tan because that's what his language output was, Tan. Tan. Huge lesion here on the left side around the, the, the superior Sylvian fissure area. Enormous. But based on two patients like this, he postulated that language was in the left side of the brain. Kind of amazing. Of course, he said it was frontal lobe. Then Wernicke came along and helped him out. But the point is, there can be enormous amounts to be learned from individuals with rare variation. And again, this is patient HM, again, who's taught us a lot about memory. So I think we have to balance the kind of study of the individual, the study of the population, with this notion of studying of individual differences in cognition, rather than just framing things as disorders. So human and cognition and behavior is on a continuum. So is what we label as disease. In some cases, aspect of neuropsychiatric disorders may be the result of natural selection on positive traits. There is strong rationale to understand the nature of individual differences. And we have the tools to begin to connect genes to cellular function, to behavior in individuals. So I have to thank the Center for Academic Research and Training in Anthropogeny at SOC and UCSD where um, I had the opportunity with Simon Baron Cohn to develop a, a weekend uh, that dealt with this and um, um, you know, this topic and got me thinking about it, giving my first public talk in this area, which as you can see, and I apologize, has been quite speculative. And also thanking the Paul Allen Frontiers Group for listening and giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Questions? Dan, in the, in the spirit that you said you wanted to uh, raise discussion, uh, I don't usually start my questions this way, but that was a beautiful talk. I really loved it, and I couldn't agree more with uh, uh, so many of the things you said. I wanted to ask you your thoughts about one refinement, maybe, or modification that you might guess I'm going to ask you about. When you were talking about genes present in your 2007 PNAS study, the one bit of data from your own lab, and you were talking then about genes located in a place functioning in that place. I wonder if given the, the strong connection with synesthesia that I think a lot about as well, if binding together by projection across areas really means in the brain it's not a place but almost like different spider webs. And whether it might be that the gene expressed in a place is actually expressed by certain types of neurons in that place. And we want to think about those distributed circuits rather than the phrenologic place. And I just thought I'd open that up for your speculation, if that makes sense. Totally. And in fact, uh, what I showed there, uh, one of the slides was this notion of developmental disconnection. Yeah, yeah which fits with that. So, when I said that, I was really talking to the non-neurobiologists in the audience to explain why we care about the region so much. But your articulation of that is totally consistent with what I was trying to say. So thank you for that comment. Yeah, it's not, it's not just a simple area of one, uh, a simple idea of one area uh, working on its own. The brain is a distributed system. And a lot of this really, especially this focusing on these higher order association areas, they depend on connectivity. So it may be specific cells, maybe specific pathways that are actually affected there. But we have the tools to begin to dissect that. So um, Dan, I, I was telling you yesterday about how my nephew was recently diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. And because of that, I've been thinking about the strengths that come from this. And I love your talk in terms of thinking about neurodiversity and the special abilities that come. But I, it also made me think about how um, 
many of the traits that are associated with um, folks on the spectrum, so the ability to um, be obsessive compulsive, to focus, to be impervious to external um, negative uh, feedback, actually are very um, uh, good qualities for successful scientists. Right, and and so I'm wondering if you could um, comment on, on actually on two things. One is um, how autism spectrum disorder is still very much a social construct because I think within the scientific community these are not abnormal traits. These are things that we look for and that we value. And secondly, actually, what you said about fecundity and some of these traits made me wonder about the um, the lack of um, women in STEM disciplines and how fecundity is not affected for um, males with some of these traits, but it actually could be for women. And so women with these excellent traits are not passing it on to the next generation. Yeah, so that's, that's a bunch of questions. I hopefully remember them. Um, yeah, the first point is, it's likely that the things that are loading on the very broad, very, very broad construct of IQ or educational attainment or G have to do with relational reasoning and focus and things like that. And so as we get large enough samples and have good enough neuropsychology in them, we're likely to be able to dissect that and to find actually what the specific neurobiological basis of that is rather than the general concepts that we're using. But it is striking and kind of evidence of almost certain positive selection, right, that these are also things that are, that are um, giving a rise to educational attainment. Um, in terms of your second question, um, it, it depends on the disorder. In schizophrenia, there's some literature that actually fecundity may be increased in females with schizophrenia. Um, it's definitely decreased in males. So I think it varies, but your point about autism spectrum is very, very interesting in that, you know, maybe there are societal expectations about how males are allowed to behave and how women are allowed to behave, and again, this gets borne out and um, of course, I didn't mention it, but the sex ratio in autism is about three to 3.5 to one male to female. Some of that is clearly, um, some of that has been linked, although we don't know, you know, to genetic etiology. And some of that may be the female brain ability to buffer that risk, and there's quite a bit of evidence for that. Um, and some of it may also be under diagnosis. So, um, Great talk, Dan. So you talked a little bit about the pleiotropy and, and how we currently define these disorders with DSM, and you know, that really drives how they're researched clinically and on the basic science side. So I'm just wondering if you could talk about how, how we could make forward and moving beyond those current kind of human paradigms to actually try and get at some of the larger questions you've raised. Yeah, I think we have to do population level research. I think having electronic medical records and, you know, and you know, certain countries like uh, Nordic countries have really embraced this and actually have a huge advantage. Denmark, um, Iceland has done this with decode, but it's a relatively, it's tenfold smaller, almost 20 fold smaller than Denmark or Sweden. They have relatively large enough populations where you could do this. In our country, my sense is you get the disease domain experts together, but you phenotype across the population. And so rather than having um, instant, uh, funding agencies paying for you know, ascertainment of large numbers of patients. They come through the health systems. And we can phenotype them like, you know, using um, a lot of mobile devices, a lot of web-based phenotyping. Um, there's a lot of cognitive testing and other things that can be done on the web, and that's getting more and more sophisticated. We can look at circadian behaviors. We can look at sleep. We can understand mood from, um, and, and one can analyze language using an Alexa or Google uh, device. And so I think that if we can connect that type of data to the medical record and then use those biobanks at attached to the health system to genotype those people, we'll have a much better idea really of what the relationship, the etiologic relationship of these disorders are to each other and be able to connect them to underlying um, genetic variation. Um, I think um, there was also, you know, I mentioned this one you know, this issue of, under -acer you know, of, of improper ascertainment of these large, you know, mutations. A really, uh, 22Q deletion, DeGeorge syndrome, is probably, I think, the most common 
genetic disorders seen in clinics. And it has a high risk, supposedly, for schizophrenia and autism. Um, it's been used as a marker for prodromal psychosis. And it was thought that 30% of patients have autism, 30% uh, schizophrenia. And what's interesting is that in Denmark, they did a population level study and found that the odds ratio for these disorders was markedly less than previously thought, so that there are a lot of normal carriers walking around. Now again, careful phenotyping would probably show that they have very specific strengths and weaknesses. So again, I think there's a lot of value for thinking about these disorders in populations. It will also allow us, knowing what the risk is and knowing what we're talking about, will actually allow us on a patient level to give more individualized, specific advice. You have this variant. Right now, our, our expectations in medical genetics are based on these cohorts that have been ascertained for disease rather than population. So anyway, um, I hope that answers your question, Brian. It's a good question. I, I've got a question over here. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the beautiful introduction, especially to someone who's not an expert in this field. Um, I have a background that covers epidemiology to a certain extent, but not neuroscience. Um, I'm curious if you were to do the stratification using a different um, primary selecting tool or um, behavior, whether the stratifications would come out the same or different. I, I go back to your example of artistic talent, and I'm wondering if you were to go, for example, and look at a cohort of musicians as a population to, to do your uh, GWAS on what you would find if you went to Juilliard and Curtis and those places. Uh, would you come up with something similar or something entirely different, or has it been done? Some of that's been done at just the level of, um, you know, I don't want to say pop psychology, but almost at that level, like, you know, the rate of left-handedness and dyslexia and MIT professors is high, you know, that kind of thing. Um, um, there's some interesting observations along those lines. I was talking with David Rowich last night, and our colleague Simon Baron Cohn is a fellow of Trinity College. Trinity College has 20% uh, of its members at, at Cambridge are uh, math majors. And um, they are, um, you can pick them out, right, by the lack of gaze and other things. And so he's actually started to study that population for a lot of these, you know, neuropsychologically. I think we're at a point, though, where we don't have the precision and the refinement in terms of what phenotypes to look at that would be most relevant, right, to study. Um, you know, what, what are the phenotypes that connect schizophrenia and autism? What is that? Is that temporal lobe connectivity with frontal lobe? Is that what we're talking about? I mean, that's the, you know, and then how do we measure that in patients or in subjects? And so um, I think ascertainment is critical. And I think as a geneticist, and, you know, speaking for geneticists, I probably shouldn't, um, and, you know, and neuroscientists, it, it's really striking to me how huge an effect for ascertainment has on these odds ratio calculations, which I think has been enormously underestimated. So your point is very well taken, and I think different ascertainment strategies would totally change the prevalence of what's found. So sort of growing evidence that there's greater genetic variability in our closest relatives than there is in, in humans on the one side. Then on the other, is, is, are these diseases you're talking about, are they human specific? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, well, certainly, uh, so far, um, I don't think we know enough about that. I think you bring up a larger question, which is our kind of human focus with disease in general that doesn't have to do even with brain disorders, even in things like cancer, heart disease, skin diseases. There are a lot of disorders that are shared across the animal kingdom and that just happen to afflict us. So I think we can learn a lot from studying them. That being said, um, I just don't think enough is known about these disorders. You know, some people sometimes say, you know, and then you have, like, in, in the great apes, you have different types of, vastly different types of social behavior are kind of, uh, you know, part of, you know, 
chimps versus bonobos, uh, you, know, you know, and they're very close, you know, uh, genetically from what we see. So I think we can learn a lot from that. I think it's a difficult issue, especially given the moratorium on, you know, on research in that area, and that's really going to close down, I think, a lot of the molecular windows. I think there could be a lot of interesting work connecting genes to brain regions, gene regulation to regional connectivity and behaviors. Um, you know, people have called, you know, anecdotally people have said, oh, well, all chimps are kind of autistic, right? You know, you know they're on the, um, so, you know, what can I say? <laughs> Last question. Uh, that was a great talk. I really appreciated um, how you focus about neurodiversity that is present and um, uh, in, in, in patients with autistic uh, disorders, especially having a, also a nephew that was recently diagnosed with autism but exhibited mild behavioral problems. Um, so, but my question is, um, I also have a two-year-old and I was surprised when I went to um, his 18-month-old checkup to have gone through a series of uh, checklists um, that would detect potential uh, risk for autism. And, um, and I guess I wondered in the neurodevelopmental perspective, like do they already find, uh, are there common, common sort of like initiation, I, I mean common, uh, what am I looking for, um, characteristics that are already present very early on before they even exhibit uh, you know, any probably differences in social behavior or language or anything like that. Is there something in brain development at this very early aspects that's already, uh, that, could, that could be used in terms of future diagnosis and maybe be able to kind of um, uh, treat this potential developmental mechanisms that are gonna be perturbed? So just to answer that um, quickly, um, the large effect size major de novo mutations seem to affect very, uh, developmental programs that are in cerebral cortex involved in neurogenesis and patterning. So this is during mid-fetal brain development. So if you look at their maximal levels of expression and when they're turned on most, it's in early fetal brain development. Those are the large effect genes. Common variation comes on a little bit later and probably why it has smaller effect. Um, that the diagnosis of autism, per se, is generally not stable until 24 to 36 months. However, children at very high risk can be identified sometimes at six months. So, it, you know, that doesn't mean some of the kids at high risk are going to just develop just fine, but, the, but we can identify kids who, let's say, have a 50 or 60 percent chance of autism or a serious developmental disorder usually between 12 and 18 months. And that's why the screener is being done at 18 months and, um, you know, in pediatric practices. So, yes, and, and the other point is that because the brain is modifiable by the environment, early intervention can help quite significantly. So that's why the early detection is quite important. Okay. So, anyway, I want to, I think I'm finished. I want to thank the Allen Institute I'm, because I'm not sure exactly how to say this, but I guess it's kind of uh, fun giving a talk, not about any of my data, and not having to show any of my data. So I think I'm just never going to show data again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.